And here with us now to reflect on the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. is Dr. Aubrey Hendricks, Jr., Ph.D. He is the author of The Universe Beds Towards Justice, Radical Reflections on the Bible, the Church, and the Body Politic, and also of The Politics of Jesus, Rediscovering the True Revolutionary Nature of Jesus' Teachings and How They Have Been Corrupted. He is past president of Payne Theological Seminary, and uh, he is the author of a recent piece on the macro ethics of Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, Dr. Hendricks, thanks so much for coming on the program. My pleasure, my pleasure. So tell us uh, first, if you would please, uh, what are macroethics? Macroethics really uh, like your know, ethical constellation. It's, uh, uh, you know, the configuration of one's ethics, because you know, um, everyone has, a, has a, a group of ethics that, they, uh, that underlie the way they live. Not everybody uh, is conscious of them, but King was. So it's really... Um, the, the constellation of ethics that uh, are determinant of, of how you live in the world. So maybe it's an ethics that includes, uh, you know, the obvious ethical injunctions we think about, uh, do not steal, do not lie, do not kill, but also maybe that includes our obligations to one another, our social obligations, society's obligations, those types of things? Yeah, and it's, it's uh, the macroethics are our basic ethics. Um, you know, for instance, um, should not steal really falls under the rubric of honesty, um, and that's a that's a mac- macro ethic that covers all kinds of things. You know, lying, stealing, that kind of thing. Uh, is that clear? Did I make that? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I th- I think w- w- and what I wanted to talk to you about now that we uh, look back on uh, Dr. King's birthday this this past week. Uh, you, your, you took the focus in your article of um, talking about what might be called his hour of darkness. You know, that so many people remember uh, Dr. King uh, in certain ways and certainly for his triumphs, but uh, a lot of people who weren't around at the time of his death uh, don't realize the extent to which he was, in effect, abandoned or uh, even turned against by many people who had been his supporters, right? Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. He was, and uh, it was a very traumatic time. Um, uh, it, it seemed like everyone turned against him. Um, all of the, well, the White House turned against him, Congress uh, spoke out against you know, various congressmen, even the uh, Civil rights establishment uh, spoke out against him, and we're not just we're, we're talking about rejecting his position. Um, the Pittsburgh uh, Defender, a major African American uh, newspaper at, at the time, said that he was misleading black people. In all, 163 uh, newspapers and periodicals uh, attacked Martin Luther King uh, on his stand on uh, on um, <clears throat> on the Vietnam War. Um, and uh, Washington Post went as far as to say that he really had no, no longer had, had uh, relevance to black people or to white people. So it was a really, a, a really, really uh, tough time for him. One thing I did not mention in the article is that uh, those in him said that he, through that period, sometimes he was just burst into tears. It was so painful for him. Oh, I didn't know that. And you know, we're talking to Doctor Do- uh, Doctor Aubrey Hendricks about Martin Luther King Jr. and and uh, his final uh, his final year. You know, uh, one of the things uh, a lot of people don't remember. It's not played up, obviously, in the official kind of hagiographies of, of of his life. But he did speak out against militarism. He did speak out against uh, economic oppression. He did speak out against the war in Vietnam. And uh, one of the things I did not know, sir, until I read your article, was that in the final poll taken when, while he was alive, and I'm quoting your article, more than 70% of Americans thought him ir- irrelevant. A full 55% of blacks opposed him or found him no longer socially useful. That, to me, is a stunning, uh, is a stunning commentary. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really painful. Uh, another really in, important commentary on a num- number of levels is uh, provided by this, this this fact that when uh, King was trying to recruit support for the Poor People's Campaign, on one occasion he called a meeting and invited a hundred ministers uh, in Virginia, and not one showed up. Wow, zero, not 
one showed up. Now, in his heyday, you know, they would have been tripping all over themselves to uh, to be in, in his presence. Um, but they saw, they, they didn't see that as, they didn't see fighting capitalism as part of their fight. And that's something that's so important about King. We, we talk about intersectionality now. It's a new thing. But King saw it way back when. Hmm. And, um, you know, he was the first major figure to ever uh, to really um, link the war with uh, with economic um, exploitation. Uh, you know, others did it, um, but you know, um, but they weren't the major figure that he was. That made him a, a larger target. Um, so it's ex- it's extraordinary that he he did all that, but it did cause those who weren't ready to to uh, to reject him. You know, uh, looking back, it, it was such a, and, and, you, and you talk about this in your, your article, Dr. Hendricks, it was such an act of courage to take, uh, he, 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 here is a person who had everything in terms of public recognition, a public admiration, Nobel Prize at an extraordinarily young age, and could have could have taken the comfortable route, and nobody would have criticized him for it. Yeah, that uh, you know could have continued to talk about. Uh, strictly the issues. I mean, I think uh, the impression I get is that a lot of people were, were just offended. That, uh, that's not your issue. Militarism is not your issue. Capitalism is not your issue. Your issue is civil rights. You stay in your lane, sir. I feel like that was the message people were giving to him. And I feel like the message he was giving back is my lane is where my conscience calls me. And my conscience calls me to talk about, as you said, the intersectionality, the interconnectedness of these different issues, whatever happens to me personally as a result. No, absolutely. He was um, he was right on target. I was so intent on on listening to you, I I, I lost the main point again. Just just uh, in a phrase or a sentence, just uh, rephrase it for me. Sure. I I guess I would say that you know. First of all, I was just making the comment that this was um, this was a. Uh, act again of such courage and that basically oh, yeah. his refusal to uh play the role oh, that okay, was given right, to him yeah. that 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 right. basically no i i, I think another right. way to put it is no you talk about black issues and you don't we don't we didn't ask you to talk about the interconnection of african-american issues with economic issues right. with military issues yeah is, is right part of it. It, it it's also another part was that you know, as a black preacher, he was not supposed to um, have the intellectual acuity hmm. uh, to engage in such uh, social analysis. I mean, I, I get that. I've been teaching for 30 years. I have an Ivy League PhD. I have public book, books, and people still question whether I I have the right uh, to write about uh, you know economics and political economy. Uh, they they don't know how, that I went to. Graduate School of Business, Rutgers Graduate School of Business, and worked on Wall Street for ten years, but they shouldn't have to know that. Um, but in, in King's case, uh, it highlights something about the the, the church. Um, well, a couple of things. One is that there is a, a depth of deep, a dearth of, of deep analysis, social analysis. In, in the church, and of course we know there's this anti-intellectual bias, and I, unfortunately we see that a lot in the black church. And so what that means is they don't under, don't really get that, for instance, capitalism is not the, the natural, inexorable way things have to be. Um, that, that there does not have to be a, a, a huge swath of, of poor people. Um, many, many of them didn't, didn't, didn't see that. I mean, there were many preachers saying, look, just give me Jesus, and uh, <laughs> you can have the whole world. Just give me Jesus. There's a song like that. And, and so... Hmm? No, I, 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 I was just going to say, um, when Jesus saw the moneylenders in the temple, as I recall, he threw them out. He didn't bail them out. Exactly, exactly. And then, uh, you know, when his... Uh, a seminal manifesto in Luke 4 said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. I mean, I mean, that talks about structural change. What is good news to the poor except uh, that the relationships and the institutions uh, and, that, uh, and laws that make them poor and keep them poor will be changed? But all those things, and they're lost on, the, on most of the church now today. King was so far ahead of his time 
and so courageous. And by the way, in terms of courage, everyone around King told him not to make that speech. Mm. I mean, I'm talking about closest ad- advisors like Stanley Levinson, um, uh, 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 Ambassador Vanner, who's a wonderful man and a, f- a friend of mine now, um, he suggested that King take his time, wait a little later to do it, and that was like one of the nicest comments that he got, one of the more supportive <laughs> ones. He stood up against every everything that told him and everybody told him he should not do it because his macro ethic, the prevailing one was justice, and justice is not doing justice is not divisible. And so if something is unjust, that is his bailiwick. That is his call, his biblical call to stand up against it. And that's the importance of this whole, uh, this whole concept of, uh, of, of macro ethics, because if you ask people to identify where they stand, uh, what, what, what their, uh, their ethical basis is for, for, for moving, um, uh, those who haven't thought about it have to think about it, and those who have will, will know you know, where they where they stand because uh, in the biblical tradition justice the word just just as mishpat is the most often used word in the Hebrew Bible in the whole Bible and Jesus talked about poor people more than anything else and uh, in in the Gospels and so those should be our concerns and really foundational to our ethical constellation. So was you know in, in in reading about Dr. King and the and, and the and the challenges of his uh, final months and year, uh, I almost get the picture of a man. Now you mentioned that he you know he was moved to tears by the rejection and and, and so on. That uh, he, a man who couldn't not do what he was impelled to do by his values or his ethics. In other words, that is almost as if. And, and I mean this in the most respectful way because it was such courage, but it, almost as if he was compelled to do it because his conscience would allow him to do nothing other. Am I projecting that onto him, or is that... Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, no, you're absolutely right. In fact, he said that in his speech. You know, he said that... Uh, uh, well, he essentially said that, that same thing, that he has to do that. The minister of the gospel, he can't be faithful um, and not speak out against things that are harming um, you know, God's the children of God, God's human creation. Um, it, it is, and the, the problem with this focus on I had a dream, I have a dream, and the dreamer, is that it misses all of that, and, but it, 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 it takes the, the pressure off, uh, off of folk to have to do anything. You know, um, if it's in particular, and certainly nothing, you know, nothing institutional. They they have nothing to to, to do. Uh, it doesn't put any responsibility on them to fight, um, to wage a structural battle for uh, for you know, structural structural justice. And so it's uh, <laughs> it's, it's it's a very complex thing one way, and it's very simple in another. Well, and I guess it leads me to the the question we're talking with Dr. Obrey Hendricks about Martin Luther King. It leads me to the question of when so many people in this country, either religiously or spiritually or ethically, say they follow in the Judeo-Christian tradition, and that tradition is founded on texts that, that privilege justice above any other principle, then... Why are there so few people following the example of Dr. King? Yeah, well, I think there are a lot of reasons. One is, you know, historically, we know that when Emperor Constantine in the 4th century uh, declared himself the 13th apostle appointed by God, which meant that no one could tell him anything, um, it was at that time that the the faith of the uh, oppressed became the religion of the oppressor. Hmm. And um, it's at that time that what you believed became more important than what you did. And evidence of that is uh, all the councils that they spent time with coming up with various dogma and all that. Even though Jesus taught no dogma, he taught ethics, how to live and how to treat each other. And historically, that's been the trajectory. Um, mainstream Christianity is almost always identified uh, with uh, the dominant class, the, uh, the power, you know, the, the, the position of those in power, the powers that be. 
rather than uh, those who are trying to resist the oppression. In our present moment, we have many uh, folk who are, are what I, I call ideological Christians in that they understand Christianity through the prism of their own interests. We see that on the right wing quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Their interests uh, are, are they, it's like they uh, deify their own interests. And, uh, and that, so that doesn't include the, the interests for so many does not include changing the status quo. Um, right. So it's not in their ideological interest. And many, and many don't don't change. They're very sincere. They just don't know any better. I mean, because the Bible's not being taught that way. So what we have is many people who are deeply sincere uh, about their faith, but they're just sincerely wrong. Right. Um, they've not been taught that the, that justice is acting out of justice is the most important thing we're called to do to treat uh, our fellow human beings and the environment um, and all God's creation in the most fair way that we can. And when we say justice, we're talking about egalitarian justice, um, meaning that uh, Jesus said, for instance, that the sun shines on everybody, I'm, par- I'm paraphrasing. Right. And uh, yes. Right. And, and unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there, but I, I, I'm so glad we had a chance to talk about this. I encourage people to read your, your article, Dr. Obery Hendricks, and I, I'll just close with the thought that, you know, if people deify, it is beautifully put that if people deify their own self-interest, as you put it, I would just say then they're probably worshiping false idols. Um, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and may I, may I say this last? I, I, it's important. I'm a senior fellow at the Opportunity Agenda. Okay. Oh, good. York. Okay. I want, to, mm-hmm. I want to make sure that that. I'm familiar with that as well. Thank you. All right. Well, sir, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you for writing this piece about Dr. King, uh, and uh, we appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you.